We will continue. Uh, last week we ended in Matthew 10, so we will continue in Matthew 11. Um, and the first little thing that you got here is in verse 12, and it kind of sounds a little bit weird. And the different, make, this is one of those verses that is translated differently in different transla translations. So it, it's one of those things that, that kind of sounds like it's saying something that's not. Matthew 11, 12 says, um, I'm sorry, I'm in 10, 12. 11, 12 says, uh, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently, and violent men take it by force. So then ASB has one of the better translations, which is why I picked it. But some of the other ones kind of vary, where they make it sound like, wait, is it saying is going forward with great enthusiasm, that the kingdom of heaven is going forward with great enthusiasm, and people who are zealous for the kingdom are taking it? What? That doesn't make any... Like, it just... There's a lot of different translations, and they all kind of do different things with it to try and fix it. But it seems like the most likely translation here is the, the one that, that... the simplest one as well. So... John the Baptist was the transition, okay? That you had the law, which was given by Moses and it was followed by the Jews, up until when? When was the law no longer in effect? Well, Jesus lived under the law. So we kind of have a little bit of a time frame there. Well, then this verse kind of also adds a little bit that John the Baptist had this really um, interesting role of being a transition. Okay, he was... He was a transitionary figure. So then Jesus, he lived under the law, right? But then what he did with his life and teachings and death and resurrection, he established the new thing. So it's kind of like there was an overlap, okay? Jesus lived under the old while establishing the new. And John the Baptist, think of him as like the pillars connecting the two together, okay? So it says that, um, what does it say? Okay, right here in verse 14. So I'll, I'll read 12 through 14. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. That's when the cutoff was. And if you are, um, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah, who was to come. Now we're gonna have to come back to that because it sounds like he's talking about reincarnation. So let's just put a pin in that, okay? Um, Uh, the the Old Testament talked about how um, the the and the Jews were looking for the Elijah to come. John the Baptist was that Elijah to come. He was the forerunner of the Christ, the one who prepared the way. Um, the time the time of the prophets went to John up up until John the Baptist, and he was one of the prophets. So now, what, what does that mean now? We're looking at this verse now. I, I I've said a bunch of different things. How does how do we put this together? Okay. So, the kingdom of heaven was facing persecution all the way from John the Baptist up until the time that Jesus was currently talking. Okay? So, now that we've got that, the day, the, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently. Okay? So, they're, they're facing persecution. And what he's saying here is that it, that would continue, the persecution would continue, and it would actually get worse as well. If you read in the chapter before, Matthew 10, he talks about the way that he's sending the disciples out to, to go, and he talks about the way that what, the, what they're going to do when they face persecution. We talked about this two weeks ago, where he says, okay, so if they don't receive you, just go to the next place, because this is not the time for you guys to get martyred. I, I'm still here. You know, you guys go throughout the towns of Israel you won't even be, be be done by the time that I meet back up with you, and then we'll move on. And so he's saying, hey, the the time for you guys to be to be killed for for me is not yet. So then, in here, he's talking he's talking about John the Baptist, and he says, okay, so we've been facing this persecution. John the Baptist was facing it too, and that that's going to go on, but it's going to actually get worse than that. It's been treated violently, and, and then he says, and violent men take it by force. So. This is something that's going to go on. And so what does it mean the violent men take it by force? Violent men are pressing up against it. Think of like Herod the Great, for instance, who was trying to kill Jesus. Think about um, you know, the, the, different, the different Pharisees and stuff that are trying to oppose Jesus. They're trying to oppose the disciples. They're trying to – and then it only got worse and worse until, yes, they, you know, John the Baptist got killed for his righteousness. Jesus got killed. Um, a lot of his disciples got killed. So it got progressively worse. So these people were trying to seize power and control, and they were trying to do it oftentimes by seizing hold of the kingdom of heaven. 
So when he says here, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently with this is persecution going on. And then he says, and violent men take it by force. They're trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to control it. They're trying to maybe get their status from it. They're trying to maybe squash it. Um, there's a lot of different different ways that that can apply, and that's really the the th the translation that makes the most sense. Some people uh, kind of ask the question of. So you're saying that you have to be violent for the kingdom of heaven to progress? Like, is Jesus saying that this is a good thing, or is he saying it's a bad thing? And he's not necessarily saying that this is a good thing that you should be modeling. He's saying this is the way that things are. And then he goes on for all the prophets and law, and then he goes on to talk about how John, John the Baptist worked as the forerunner and all that stuff. So um, now that we've gotten that part out, we can go to verse 14, which is up here on the screen. Where it talks about, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is, is Elijah who is to come. That makes it sound like, so he's only the Elijah to come if you can accept it. So if you can't accept it, he's not Elijah to come. And that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, um, it would be maybe if I said it differently, John himself is Elijah who was to come, but you might not be ready to hear that yet. So the Bible teaches something called foreshadowing. Now, foreshadowing is not reincarnation. And I'll explain a little more of the details in just a second. But foreshadowing basically where something points to a greater fulfillment. A good example of this that the book of Hebrews points out is there's a, prof, a priest in the book of Genesis called Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a Christ figure. He was he foreshadowed Jesus as the coming Messiah. Okay, So was he Jesus? No. Was Jesus Melchizedek reincarnated? No. No, we're talking about a role, not the person's soul, okay? The, the, the person's role pointed t towards it. So Melchizedek wasn't Christ or God. So with that being said, John the Baptist was not Elijah. He was the function of Elijah, not the being of Elijah. If that Does that kind of make sense? Elijah was a was a role, the coming Elijah. See, Elijah was this really great prophet. And by saying that there was going to be a, a the, they're looking forward to this Elijah, they don't literally mean Elijah coming coming back to earth. Although there is something that needs to be said. There's a lot of people in end times theology who believe that Elijah, literally Elijah, the original Elijah, will come back and be one of the um, two um, witnesses in the book of Revelation. Now, there's really nothing in the Bible that says that that is. They just assume because he didn't actually die physically. But it seems like he did die. It's just that he didn't die as normal people do. He was taken into heaven, and that was like his body died, and he was get, taken into eternity. That's how it seems, especially because, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, he shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses, clearly in the same way as though he is in heaven having this you know revelation of himself just like Moses so the question being if he didn't die then why was he the same as Moses when Moses did die like see what I mean like it just doesn't really follow suit and I think that sometimes people just because there's so much uncertainty with the end times they try to just like tie everything in and I, I don't know there's just nothing in the Bible that actually says that he will be one of the two witnesses so back on track um, the Jews were looking for a coming prophet, a coming Elijah. And it's just like um, you could say that they were looking for a coming Moses because in the in the law, of Moses talked about how there would be a greater prophet than him who would come. And so you could say that Jesus was um, the coming Moses. So I mean, like it's it's more of a more of a claim of title and and the person's um, what's it called um, their their name, their um, reputation, I guess, is a way of saying that. So Elijah appeared at the Mount uh, the Mount of Transfiguration alongside Moses and Jesus, but Elijah was still Elijah when he showed up, and this was after John the Baptist died. So if John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated, why wasn't John the Baptist the one who showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration? Why was it Elijah? So obviously Elijah was still Elijah, and John the Baptist was still John the Baptist, so it was no reincarnation there, but there's there's more to it than that. Um, another thing is it said here, um, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He doesn't say that he was Elijah. He said that he was Elijah, the Elijah to come. Moral of the story being he's pointing, he, Jesus is clearly pointing at John the Baptist's role, not his 
inner spirit as being a reincarnation. Um, the Elijah to come was a figure that they expected, that they were looking forward to, but he didn't teach reincarnation. Elijah didn't die, so he couldn't reincarnate. In reincarnation, somebody has to die and enter back into the spark before they can be reborn into that same process. Elijah never died on this earth. He was taken up into heaven. So he couldn't actually be reincarnated because you have in reincarnation you have to actually die in this earth and be reborn into this earth. I was just say like the rapture. It's like, it's like an Old Testament version of the rapture. Like how Enoch was taken up. Sort of, yeah. Sort of. Um, so, uh, so anyways, by the definition of reincarnation, he couldn't actually be reincarnated. Um, something that I already mentioned that. Oh, and then there's then there's another issue that reincarnation is refuted elsewhere, um, where it says that it is appointed to man once to die. And why does it not mention that here? Because that wasn't the issue that Jesus is addressing here. Jesus is not addressing reincarnation here. In Hebrews, when it says man is appointed one time to die, that's something else he's talking about. But here, the, he, Jesus wasn't talking about reincarnation, so it, he doesn't address the fact that John the Baptist wasn't Elijah reincarnated. So then we get to verses 28 through 30. And um, it sounds like Jesus is saying that things are easy and hard at the same time. So, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son determines to reveal him. Come to me, all who, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is comfortable and my burden is light. But in the same time, he talks about how difficult it is following him. How you have to take up your cross, how there's going to be all these struggles and persecutions. And so the question becomes, hold up, Jesus. Is it going to be easy or is it going to be hard? Because you've said both. You've said take your burden because it's easy, but then you've said, oh, by the way, it's going to be hard. So what, are, what do I do with this? Well, see, Jesus is talking about two different things, though. Christian life is hard and filled with difficulty, but life is going to be hard and filled with difficulty anyways. So there, there's three aspects. Life with or without God is difficult. Okay, When you follow Christ, it's going to have its own difficulties, and Jesus talks about that in great lengths else, in other places. There's going to be things that you face that you wouldn't have had to face otherwise, but... Christ's burden is light because we don't have to earn our salvation and it brings rest for our souls. See, what Jesus is talking about here, he's literally talking about the law. How he, he's, he's, and I'll, I've actually preached out of this before, how he's, how he's fulfilling the law. And so what he's more talking about is, is come alongside me, take my yoke, where you don't have to follow the dead works of the law. And it's, 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 you don't have to constantly work for salvation, constantly be paranoid about whether you're doing everything right, constantly looking forward to the coming Christ, because here I am, guys. So it's an easy burden, because you don't have to follow the weight of the law. So those are two different things, if you, if you really look at it. Jesus here, is with it being light, he's talking about your salvation. But with it being difficult, he's talking about following him, even when it gets difficult. So those are really not contradictions. Those are two different aspects, if you'll take it that way. So Matthew chapter 12, 1 through 5 says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads off grain and eat. Now when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions... How he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who, with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? So it sounds like here he's saying... So, okay, let me say this differently. He said elsewhere that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. But right here, it sounds like it sounds like he's saying it's totally fine to break the law. So it sounds like you got Jesus kind of contradicting himself. Well, let's kind of look at take a step at this. First off, God never said that they couldn't eat on the Sabbath. 
they were the the law said you couldn't work on the Sabbath, so they couldn't go out to the field and, and harvest. That you could not do. But it was never against the law to eat on the Sabbath. What they were doing, what were they actually doing? They were walking through, and as they were going, they were just picking off the heads and eating them. They were not harvesting the field. They were eating because they were hungry. It looks like you were about to say something. No, no, I was just saying because I think to the Pharisees, eating eating the grain is like preparing the grain in, in the meal. You know, you're crushing it. You're, you're, I don't know, I guess it goes through a similar, a similar process when you chew the when you chew the grain as to when you're crushing it. No, no, no. What, what? And I'll talk about this in just a minute. They uh, made their own law that was above and beyond what the law said, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, so the next thing is that that they failed to understand is that. So not only did God never say that they couldn't eat on the Sabbath, but the second thing, the law, the the whole purpose for the Sabbath was for men's benefit. Men were not created for the benefit of the Sabbath. And they didn't understand that the law was given for a purpose. They thought man was just created for the purpose of following the law so that everything could be better. But another thing to kind of point out is, and this is something that um, uh, you kind of led me into there. Um, so he says here, um, th I'm sorry, let me say this differently. The law didn't actually say that they couldn't pluck this. The Pharisees made their own sets of rules. So the, the law of Moses has 613 commands. Well, then the Pharisees decided we need to make sure that people don't even go near breaking any of these because that's why we were exiled from our homeland is because we trampled the law. So we need to make sure we don't do this again. So they made another law. This is the... The Fer the Pharisees' traditions, uh, they're called um, – oh, I can't remember what it's called right now. But it's basically the traditions. The, the, they added their own oral traditions to go alongside this. And the Pharisees are criticizing the disciples because they're breaking the Pharisees' traditions. They're not breaking the law. They're breaking the Pharisees' traditions. And does that kind of kind of make sense? And their tradition was it wasn't enough that you couldn't work on the Sabbath. You also couldn't so much as, as, as even pluck a, uh, pluck a head from the grain. You couldn't so much as, as even – see what I mean? They, they went above and beyond to make sure nobody even kind of sort of broke this law. And it's like, well, that, that really wasn't in the law. So here they're getting all upset at the disciples because the disciples aren't following the traditions. And Jesus didn't teach them to break the law. But they weren't breaking the law. So he just wasn't holding them to the higher standard of a Pharisee. It would be the equivalent of going to church, right? And uh, you're wearing a hat in the church, and somebody's really upset about it. We're not going to enforce that rule. Well, why not? You're disrespecting the house of God. N no, no, I'm not, and they're not either. That's your own hang-up. I'm not going to force people to do that because you have a problem with that. Like, what do you want me to do, kick out, kick out all the teenagers that come because you have a problem with hats? Like, I'm sorry that you have that, but, I mean, I don't have that problem, and I don't see the point of making people mad for no reason. Were you going to say something? No. Oh, okay. So then uh, verse uh, 40 of chapter 12. For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The question being, how the heck did this guy learn to count? Because if you die on Friday and you rise Sunday morning, that's like at best like two days. See what I mean? You've got Sunday all day. I mean Saturday all day. You got Sunday. He wo he rose. Before the moon, before the sun is up, evidently, because the girl, women were there pretty early, and he was already gone. And then you've got Friday evening is when he was buried. So it's like, how is this possibly three days? Well, it's really not as as complicated as people make it out to be. There's a lot of people who just kind of major on minor things. And in in Jewish thought, things weren't literal. They could say three days, and it not actually mean a span of three 24-hour days. That's that's totally acceptable. It means 
even if you said like day and night, it, it doesn't mean the full day and night. And so three days and nights could involve any part of those three days. So Jesus was killed on the, the latter part of the first day, was in the grave the second day, and then he rose on the beginning of the third day. It's three days. So it's three days and three nights. Not three complete days and nights. Not exactly 24-hour periods three times three. But once again, that's, that's totally acceptable for Jewish thought. It might not be acceptable for us, because that's not how we think, but that doesn't mean that he's wrong. There was there's an there's another theory that Jesus actually died on Wednesday because there's not that day is not accounted for when it, when you when you're putting together the the week of Je the Jesus's final week Wednesday we don't have any details for Wednesday so there's some people who say okay so he actually died on Wednesday and the Passover was was a floating day it could have happened on any of the days I, as far as I know the Passover didn't float it was on the same day, as far as I know. I mean, I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure no. And he didn't die on Wednesday. He died on Thursday. It just you you could you could say follow the whole Wednesday thing, and that would get rid of the problem. Wednesday evening, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. See what I mean? You you could, or I guess it'd be Thursday evening. Um, yeah, Thursday evening. I mean, sorry, but that doesn't really seem to me overly likely. So, anyways. Any questions on that? Okay, so we'll go to Matthew 13. Getting a little hard to see my Bible. <laughs> 31 through 32 says this. Um, he, pre he presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the green and than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds in the sky come and nest in its branches. Um... Excuse me, um, Jesus, that's not the smallest seed, and it, it's not the largest tree either. Well, once again, this is, this is more an issue of not understanding what Jesus is saying, not an issue of Jesus being wrong. First off, of the, of the seeds that farmers in the Middle East, Palestine, planted in their gardens... The mustard seed was the smallest. Yes, that is true. It's not that it's the smallest seed in the whole world. It's that of the ones that the Palestine farmers planted in their gardens, it was the smallest of them. And, or I should say sowed in their fields, that would be more accurate. And the mustard seed could grow into trees that reached 10 feet tall. So, let's say, is that the tallest tree in the world? Well, duh, no. But now let's look at what he actually said. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants. Clearly, we're talking about not seeds in the whole world. We're talking about the garden plants. And becomes a tree. A ten-foot-tall mustard tree is a tree. It might be not the largest tree in the history of the world, but the point still remains valid. A farmer has all these different seeds that he uses, and the smallest one that he has is his mustard seed. And when he plants it, it gets 10 feet tall into an actual tree. There's no, there's, Jesus isn't wrong here. The problem is, is that we think globally now, so we think Jesus must have meant globally. Okay, so it's the smallest seed in the whole of the world. No, 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 just no. The point, and another thing is, you have to ask the question, did the people who were listening to him, did they understand what he was saying? And the question is obvious, yes. Yes, they would have totally understood what he was saying. Not only do we not have any evidence of farmers going, um, yeah, that Jesus, he didn't, had no idea about seeds. But then also, that when Matthew was writing this down, just a few years after Jesus, he felt no need to correct what was said, because everybody knew what he was saying. So the verse 34, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowd in parables, and he did not speak anything to them without a parable. Hold on. Did he always speak in parables or no? Because I remember sometimes he was talking in the same book, Matthew chapter 5, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount, he was not talking in parables. Booyah. Jesus is wrong. Matthew's a liar. They're all untrustworthy. Well, now hold on. <laughs> One of those things, again, where it's like, Maybe if you just stop to think about things, you can find a more reasonable solution. Jesus spoke in parables to the crowd. 
But the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 5 he gave to his disciples. Okay, that's the first kind of important thing here. It says here in verse 34, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. It doesn't say that he always spoke in parables at all times. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak anything to them without a parable. At this time, Jesus was speaking to the crowd in parables. Everything that he said to them was in a parable. There was nothing that he said to them at this time that was not in a parable. That makes sense. Um, also, there it's kind of ambiguous. We don't know if this was his policy when every time he was talking to the crowds or just at certain situations like, for instance, this one. So we really don't know. Maybe it would be best not to say too strongly whether or not he is saying that he always spoke in parables to crowds. So, um, and it doesn't say that he that he always t spoke in parables um, to his disciples or to other people too. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so then we get to verse 45. Did that make sense, everybody? Yeah. No questions? Okay. Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Am I on the right verse? What did I do wrong here? Now, now hold on. What did I do? Okay. Um, it's supposed to be 54. I'm sorry. I typed it backwards. And he came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue with the result that they were astonished and said, Where did this man acquire this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is his mother not called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where, where then did this man acquire all these things? And the question being, now hold on, I thought Mary was a perpetual virgin, so how could she have possibly had other sons and daughters? Well, the thing, this actually isn't a Bible difficulty, it's a Catholic difficulty. The Bible doesn't teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Um, and historical Christianity really doesn't either. Uh, this was a, a, a later um, kind of, um, what's it called, corruption of, of the Christian doctrine when, when the Catholic Church started kind of just making stuff up. As far as I can tell, this this is not something that the, the for, that at least the, the earliest generations of Christianity ever condoned. It says that G Joseph didn't have sex with her until after Jesus was born. It never says that he never had sex with her. That's something else. Also, this verse is clearly talking about physical brothers and sisters. The crowd cl clearly says, aren't his brothers so-and-so? And he clearly distinguishes that his brothers are not his blood brothers, but those who do the will of the father. There's a part where, where they say, "Hey, your your brother and and mother, your brothers and mother are outside." And he says, "Who's my brother and mother? It's the person who does the will of God." So obviously, Jesus is making a distinction between blood relations and spiritual relations. So if Jesus went to the went to the difficulty of saying of making that that separation, obviously, the main point being that yes. Mary did have other sons and daughters, just as this verse says. There's no reason to assume that he didn't. So this is not an issue of doctrine. It's an issue... I'm sorry, this is an issue of Catholic doctrine, not an issue of Christianity or the Bible. So, there are no difficulties in chapter 14, 15, and that takes us to... In two weeks, we'll get on going on chapter 16. We're already like halfway through Matthew, guys. Super cool. Chapter... After Jesus, Lena was born also. So Mary and Joseph did have other kids. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, one of one of their sons was uh, uh, Judas. He wrote the book of Jude in, in the Bible, and he actually didn't believe in Jesus the whole time through his ministry. And what happened was after Jesus died and was resurrected, he came specifically to Judas and said. Yo, it's me, and Jude's like, "Holy crap, I was wrong," and so then he started believing in him, and he, he that's when he be, that's when he be, he he followed Jesus and, and believed. Yeah, after the resurrection, 
So yeah, it's so it, this is something that Paul actually tells us about, and I think it's either Galatians or Corinthians. I don't remember which, but he talks about the way that Jesus made that special trip to uh, to talk so with you. Technically brothers, or they were just hanging. Uh, they were uh, brothers, but not full blood, obviously, because they shared the same mother, not the same father. So they were half brothers. Half right. So because uh, the sperm didn't come from Joseph. Mm -hmm. God caused the baby to grow supernaturally. So, with that being said, they had the same mother, though. Go to Why I Trust the Bible by Mounts chapter uh, 4. And we'll stop there. Is it on?